Oh, hi, hello there. Welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am that host of yours, the one who most people don't think is annoying. <laughs> Liv. And today I'm here with a particular... I don't know when I wrote that. And uh, today I'm here with a particularly interesting and particularly mysterious uh, myth. I also wrote that earlier uh, before I got to sources. We're going to go with it. It's December. I am tired. Not to mention, uh, it's a myth that requires me to say a deeply odd Greek name many, many times. But we will get there. I want to remind you all that I will be doing another New Year Q&A episode so make sure you get questions in before the end of the year you can submit your questions via a form on my website mythsbaby.com slash questions uh, it's also in the episode's description this is the perfect opportunity for you to ask all the questions that you might have asked via email or dm that i haven't had a chance to reply to because i'm an introvert um with adhd who who fears replying to people um and it's my chance to feel better about that exact thing and to give you some answers Last year, we had some great questions about the ancient world and sourcing and even studying the ancient world and, uh, and, and sourcing and so much more. So I'm excited to see what you all come up with. And just a reminder, too, I'm working on a very special series of episodes that will be coming out uh, in January. I'm going to be diving into the history and mythology and like so much more behind that very, very famous ancient Greek city-state where Cassandra's from in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. That's right. It's Sparta absolutely fascinating and i've already recorded some amazing conversations that are going to go along with these episodes we are all going to learn so fucking much it's also coming to the time of year when i give myself a little break from researching and writing and recording new episodes can you tell i need it um over the last two weeks of december i will be re-airing some favorite episodes that you all have something to listen to and i in theory have time to relax when in truth i will almost certainly just be working on the spartan series but what can you do ADHD is a hell of a bitch. But that is Future Liv's problem. Today we're here with a very interesting and often forgotten mythological character. Why is it so unique and interesting and often forgotten, you ask? Well, it's one of those details from the Trojan War that probably existed in ancient Greek stories, Homeric or otherwise, but basically only survives to us today in late or even Roman sources, particularly Ovid's Heroides. I certainly first heard about this woman's story from the Heroides and nowhere else. But hers is a story that exists in other Roman sources and that we know existed beyond those little letters of Ovid written between women and the men who wronged them. This wronged woman is a nymph named Enoni. And boy, was she right to call out Paris. is episode 192. That Paris guy is worse than you think. Paris's first wife, Inoni. The story of Inoni, like I said, comes to us in detail in Ovid's Heroides. Most famously, there. But it's also told briefly in a work that is much, much less known by a poet named Parthenius from 1st century BCE. And he tells us a bit of Enoni's story that he says is from earlier works devoted to the Trojan War. And of course, she does feature into the Roman epic about the fall of Troy that is called the fall of Troy. But for all of that, these are the few remotely detailed stories that survive about Enoni. That she existed in ancient Greek sources, though, as this first wife of the famed Paris of Troy, is probably a pretty long-standing fact in the whole mythos of the Trojan War. But like so many moments and, and characters, it's just that all that's left to us now tends to be Roman. Enoni isn't mentioned in the Iliad or the Odyssey. Not that she would have really featured and had much reason to feature in the Odyssey. Still, she isn't as old as at least those Homeric epics. But she's been around for quite some time, and probably the epics that were developed just a century or so later to account for the rest of the story of the Trojan War, she was probably in there. Epics not quite as old as Homer, but certainly in the depths of Greek myth. 
To set the scene, we have to return to Troy. The story of Troy and its royal family that isn't included in the Iliad, but instead was likely told in lost epics from Greece and now comes to us primarily through fragments or later Roman adaptations of those lost epics. These bits of the story of the war and the before and after are often unclear. They have so many contradictory possibilities and details, the, the bits that are both the most interesting and the most infuriating. What matters, though, is that for now, Troy is thriving. But Paris, if you remember, doesn't yet know that he's actually a prince. When he was born, there was a prophecy that he would cause the fall of Troy. And so instead, now he's living as a shepherd on Mount Ida, totally unaware of his parentage. And that's where we return to that Trojan prince who started it all, Paris. The man who will go on to travel all the way to Greece to abduct a woman already married to a Greek man. We might imagine that Paris is not particularly bright, and perhaps better described as being ruled by his libido, if not just his ego. Though I think the ego is the one doing a lot of the damage once he does learn that he's a prince of Troy. But then, I'm getting ahead of myself. All of that is to say, it is not difficult to believe that Paris had another woman in his life, long before he ever went off in search of Helen of Sparta. Because Enoni's longest surviving source is one of the Heroides, those letters Ovid wrote between famously wronged women and the men who fucked with them, we have little of her story beyond the one that she is telling in that letter. But the poet Parthenius, who references her story, does give us at least a little bit more. Enoni was a nymph of Phrygia, that region around Troy. There, she was well known for her brilliance, her wisdom, and most importantly, her prophetic ability. And it's there she met Paris, that nice young man living a simple life as a shepherd on Mount Ida. And, it seems, the pair fell in love. Enoni went with Paris away from her family's home and traveled with him to Mount Ida, where they married, or at least they lived as a married couple, quite happily. They were, for all intents and purposes, married. Parthenius tells us that the two were so in love that Paris would frequently tell Enoni as much. He would tell her just how much he loved her, how devoted he was to her and to their relationship, how they would be together forever, happy and in love forever. He told her very specifically that he would never, ever, ever desert her. Whew. But Enoni, for all she loved Paris back, also had those skills in prophecy. She saw the future. She saw the truth. And she told Paris as much. She told him that he may believe everything that he's saying, but that she could see what he would do however many years to come. How he would leave Phrygia, leave Troy, and travel to Europe. And would there, quote, by his infatuation for a foreign woman, bring the horrors of war upon his kindred. Enoni went on to tell Paris about his own fate, which she also foresaw. She told him that he would be wounded in war and that no one except herself would be able to heal him. Paris, though, didn't want to hear those things from Enoni, and he would always stop her. He would tell her that he didn't want these prophecies of hers out there, didn't want to hear them, seeming to believe he could avoid his fate if he didn't know about it. Or maybe he just didn't believe her at all. Anyone want to take a wild guess, though, as to whether or not Enoni comes out to be on the right side of this whole situation? <laughs> Parthenius, whose version of Enoni's story is, is very brief, continues by shifting us through time. When the Trojan War has been waged for ten years, ten years of Paris living with this Greek woman, the Spartan woman, Helen, as his wife, ten years of him seemingly choosing to forget that he ever had another wife, 
Long after the Iliad is ended, right towards the end of the war, Paris is wounded by an arrow of Philoctetes. And that's when he remembers what his first wife told him, and maybe that he had a first wife at all. He remembers what his wife, Inoni, who he'd swore to love forever, to never abandon. He remembered those things that she'd told him, and that he hadn't wanted to hear. She'd told him that his travels to Europe and the taking of a Greek bride would cause ruin to Troy, and, well, she'd clearly been right. And then she'd told him he'd be wounded. Check. So he remembered the final thing that she had foreseen. Only she would be able to heal his wound. After all those years and all that time with Helen, never once speaking of, to, or of Inoni, he finally called for her. But guess what? Inoni didn't come. She knew her fucking worth, and she wasn't about to come to Paris after all that time, after everything that he'd done. She told him instead that maybe he was better off asking his new wife to heal him, since he'd uh, made perfectly clear that he preferred Helen to Inoni. And now some sources say that she eventually changed her mind, that she did try to go to Paris to heal him, but it was already too late. He'd already died. And then they say she killed herself in grief, which I just, I, why do the ancient sources always have to do women so dirty? Why do they feel like it's quite so necessary? Now that is all Parthenius tells us of Inoni's story. But as for details of the end of their story, of Paris's wound at the end of the war and his attempts to have Inoni heal him, as the only one who can, there is another source that gives us considerably more detail. Quintus Smyrnaeus, the Roman author whose version of the Fall of Troy, called the Fall of Troy, is all that survives to us today when it comes to that story of the end of the Trojan War, though we do know he was basing it off of an ancient Greek epic, or at least one, that are now lost. I've referenced this work before in the episodes on one like Memnon from Ethiopia and Penthesilea, the Amazon. Those are all from the fall of Troy. And Quintus Bernays also tells us of the moments where Paris is wounded by Philoctetes, and what happens when he does travel in search of his scorned first wife. Now, Quintus Smyrnaeus loves to be descriptive, so when he tells us that Paris traveled in search of Inoni in an effort to avoid his own death, we learn just how ominous this experience was. Quote, Evil, boding fowl shrieked over his head. He hadn't even reached Inoni yet, and he knew things were looking not so good for him. Still, he continued on. Paris knew he didn't have any other options. Finally, Paris reached her, Inoni, surprising both her and the women that attended to her. He fell at her feet in a sign of respect, but the pain of his wound ached even more as he did it. Still, he was going to do his absolute best to convince her to help him. She was his only hope. It wasn't going to be easy to convince this woman, who he'd professed his undying love to repeatedly, saying specifically that he would never abandon her. And then who he, well, abandoned for another woman. It was going to take some real effort to convince her to help him. <laughs> Do we blame Inoni? <laughs> Absolutely not. Paris is a little shit. Paris speaks to Inoni, and this is mostly a quote, but I've made some adjustments to make the language a bit e more easy to understand, because, as always, it's an old one. Oh, reverenced wife, don't turn from me in hate because I left you widowed long ago. Not of my will did I do it. The strong fates dragged me to Helen. Oh, that I had died before I'd embraced her. In your arms had I died. All by the gods I pray, the lords of heaven, by all the memories of our wedded love, be merciful. Banish my bitter pain. Lay on my deadly wound those healing salves, which only can, by fate's decree, remove this torment. 
if you will it. Your heart must speak my sentence, to be saved from death or not. Pity me? Oh, make haste to pity me. This venom's might is swiftly bringing death. Heal me while life yet lingers in my limbs. Remember not those pangs of jealousy, nor leave me by a cruel doom to die, low, fallen at your feet. This should offend the prayers, the daughters of the thunderer Zeus, whose anger follows unrelenting pride with vengeance, and the furies execute their wrath. My queen, I sinned, in folly sinned, yet from the carries save me, oh, make haste to save me. Sorry, that was really fun. There's so much going on here. Ugh, Paris. So we do not take literally any responsibility for your own actions. It's interesting because it's not like he blames Aphrodite here either. Like, just the fates? Which, to me, suggests it's even more his fault than he wants to believe. Like, sure, you can't deny the fates, but since the fates decree, like, literally everything, one's own free will is also then inextricably tied to the fates? It sounds an awful lot like Paris made all of these decisions on his own, and now he's just regretting it. Because his life depends on Inoni, and not because he actually gives a flying fuck what he did. And, well, Inoni sees this, too. Just as those fragmented versions suggest, Inoni isn't really open to forgiving Paris just because he's dying. Maybe it would have been a different story if he'd have come to her with, like, actual remorse, actually feeling bad or regretful for what he did to her, like, abandoning her in favor of Helen. But he didn't. He came to her explicitly because she was his only option. It was either her or death, so he tried his luck. And Inoni isn't stupid. She realized this, and she wasn't feeling particularly forgiving. So, with a sneer, she tells him, and again, this is a quote that I've adjusted, Go! Lie laughing in her arms for bliss. She is better than your true wife, is, rumor says, immortal. Go quickly and kneel to her, but not to me. Weep not to me, nor whimper pitiful prayers. Oh, that my heart beat with a tigress's strength, that I might tear your flesh and lap your blood for all the pain your folly brought on me. <sighs> Good stuff, Inoni. I know it's harsh because, like, he's dying, but honestly, I'm just here for her rage, for her righteous wrath. She says a bit more to him, asking where Aphrodite is now, <laughs> where the gods that helped him earlier. And then she just tells him to leave, tells him to get out of her sight, out of her home, to, quote, agonize day and night beside Helen's bed, their whimper, pierced to the heart with cruel pangs, until she heals you of your grievous pain. And that's it. Paris is forced to leave Inoni unhealed. Of course, just as I mentioned with the earlier Greek fragments, there is more to this story. The idea that Inoni later felt guilty, decided that she still loved Paris, and rushed to his side, attempting to save him before it was too late, except that it was too late, and so instead, she killed herself. I suppose I could spend the time telling you that bit, but you'll get a sense of it in the bits of the episode that are still to come, and frankly, I just don't feel like it's such a necessary addition. To me, it feels like the patriarchy coming in full force. This idea that a woman who is rightfully angry at a man for leaving her in his dust, for reasons, again, which I will get into. But she can't stay angry with him. She has to decide she's in the wrong and that she should save him. She has to run to him in all the dramatics of a man writing a woman character and then determine that she has to kill herself because she didn't save him in time. It's just, I mean, it's such a fucking tired trope. So know that it is part of her story, but we're not going to dwell on it or dramatize it because frankly, it's just deeply unnecessary to her story. And speaking of Inoni's story, one thing that doesn't come up in these sources, but I think is inherent to the story and like must be addressed somewhere that I just haven't found but is this background for why Paris felt like he had the right to just leave Inoni most of it comes down to Paris's story the one that doesn't really survive in much of the ancient Greek sources the idea that he didn't know he was a prince for most of his life so when Paris was born it was foretold that he would cause this fall of Troy his parents, though, Priam and Hecuba, they couldn't actually bring themselves to kill their baby or even expose him, which, sidebar, like, I feel like it says a lot about the Trojans, given the Greeks are literally always willing to do that, but here we are. 
They wouldn't kill their child, so instead they had a shepherd of Mount Ida raise Paris as his own. Raise him as a shepherd off in the mountains, just away from Troy and therefore thinking that he could avoid this fate. And of course, that's where he met and fell in love with Enoni, where he lived with her as his wife and for many years, and according to some versions, where they even had a child together. And then, then he learns that he's the son of Priam and Hecuba, and he's actually a prince of Troy. There's more to that story. I'm sure I've covered it in the old episodes about the Trojan War. It doesn't really matter now. What matters is that eventually he does learn he's a prince, and that comes along with Aphrodite's decree that he can have Helen, this most beautiful woman in the world, and, well, Paris is a man. (laughs) He learns that he's a prince, and he can have the most beautiful woman in the world. He doesn't even pause. It's like he doesn't even look back. To the point where Inoni doesn't appear in most versions of the story, or certainly most popular versions. Like, how many of you had heard of her before? You know? It's fascinating. He just doesn't look back. He basically decides that he can have a hotter woman because he's a prince. So, like, screw that mediocre lady he married when he was just a shepherd. You know? (laughs) He just heads out to abduct Helen, pretending that he isn't already married. Like, he just leaves his shepherd life in the past as though it never happened at all. Meanwhile, Enoni just gets to watch all of this happen. I'm sure Helen's status as a Greek comes into play, too. Neither Paris nor Enoni are Greek. They're Phrygian. And this story is ultimately coming from Greek people. So there's also, like, an inherent value placed upon Helen for being Greek, let alone a Spartan princess deemed the most beautiful and even a daughter of Zeus. So it's not hard for anyone to believe that Paris went after her when given the chance. But fortunately, we are here to talk about Inoni, at least as much as we can with uh, these deeply limited and primarily Roman surviving sources. The story of Inoni is one that I've wanted to tell for some time. I first heard her story when I was watching an adaptation of Ovid's Herodes that was put on by this theater in the UK during the pandemic. It was live streamed. It was amazing. Before that, I'd only read a couple of the Herodes and didn't, hadn't heard of her. But this idea of Paris having an earlier wife just adds so much to his story, like to his character, to his relationship with Helen. It says a lot about him in a way that I find really interesting. Plus, I mean, it just reminds us that he's a pretty shitty dude and maybe we don't need to assume that Helen ever loved him back. Still, it's possible, I suppose, but I find it less likely. But the Herodes are harder to retell in that way or in the way that I do because they're deeply personal letters written by women. So instead, I I wanted to do the episode like this. I want to tell you the other versions of Inoni's story that exist and then leave you with a reading of the Herodes. It's a short one, and you can hear it from her mouth. Or rather, her mouth as written by Ovid. So, to finish off this episode, this is Ovid's Heroides, number five, Inoni to Paris, translated by Grant Showerman. Will you read my letter, though, or does your new wife forbid it? Read. This is no letter written by Mycenaean hand, It is the fountain nymph Inoni writing, well known to the Phrygian forests, wronged, and with complaint to make of you, you my own, if you but allow. What god has set his will against my prayers? What guilt stands in my way that I may not remain your own? Softly must we bear whatever suffering is our desert. The penalty that comes without deserving brings us dole. Not yet so great were you when I was content to wed you. I, the nymph daughter of a mighty stream, you who are now son of Priam. Let not respect keep back the truth. Were then a slave, I deigned to wed a slave, I, a nymph. Oft among our flocks have we reposed beneath the sheltering trees, where mingled grass and leaves afforded us a couch. Oft have we lain upon the straw or on the deep hay in a lowly hut that kept the hoar frost off. Who was it 
pointed out to you the coverts apt for the chase, and the rocky den where the wild beast hid away her cubs. Oft have I gone with you to the stretch, the hunting net with its wide mesh. Oft have I led the fleet hounds over the long ridge. The beaches still conserve my name carved on them by you. And I am read there, Inoni, charactered by your blade, and the more the trunks, the greater grows my name. Grow on, rise high and straight to make my honors known. O poplar, ever live, I pray, that art planted by the marge of the stream and haste in the seamy bark these verses. If Paris's breath shall fail not, once Enoni heath doth spurn, the waters of Xanthus to their fount shall backward turn. O oh, Xanthus, backward haste, turn waters and flow again to your fount. Paris has deserted Enoni and injures it. That day spoke doom for wretched me. On that day did the awful storm of changed love begin. When Venus and Juno and unadorned Minerva, more comely had she borne her arms, appeared before you to be judged. My bosom leaped with amaze as you told me of it, and a chill tremor rushed through my hard bones. I took counsel, for I was no little terrified, with grandams and long-lived sires. T'was clear to us all that evil threatened me. The firs were felled, the timbers hewn, your fleet was ready, and the deep blue wave received the waxed crafts. Your tears fell as you left me. This, at least, don't deny it. We mingled our weeping, each a prey to grief. The elm is not so closely clasped by the clinging vine as was my neck by your embracing arms. Ah, uh, how often, when you complained that you were kept by the wind, did your comrades smile? That wind was favoring. How often, when you had taken your leave of me, did you return to ask for another kiss? How your tongue could scarce endure to say farewell. A light breeze stirs the sails that hang idly from the rigid mast, and the water foams white with the churning of the oar. In wretchedness I follow with my eyes the departing sails as far as I can, and the sand is humid with my tears, that you may swiftly come again. I pray the sea-green daughters of Narius, yes, you may swiftly come to my undoing. Expected to return in answer to my vows, have you returned for the sake of another? Ah, uh, me, t'was for the sake of a cruel rival that my persuasive prayers were made. A mass of native rock looks down upon the unmeasured deep. A mountain it really is. It stays the billows of the sea. From here I was the first to spy and know the sails of your bark and my heart's impulse was to rush through the waves to you. While I delayed on the highest of the prow, I saw the gleam of purple. Fear seized upon me. That was not the manner of your garb. The craft comes nearer, borne on a freshening breeze, and touches the shore with trembling heart. I have caught the sight of a woman's face. And this was not enough. Why was I mad enough to stay and see? In your embrace, that shameless woman clung. Then indeed did I rend my bosom and beat my breast, and the hard nail furrowed my streaming cheeks and filled holy Ida with wailing cries of lamentation. Yonder to the rocks I love, I bore my tears. So may Helen's grief be, and so her lamentation, when she is deserted by her love. And what was she first to bring on, may she herself endure. 
Your pleasure now is in jades who follow over the open sea, leaving behind their lawful wedded lords. But when you were poor and shepherded the flocks, Enoni was your wife, poor though you were, and no one else. I am not dazzled by your wealth, nor am I touched by thought of your palace, nor would I be called one of the many wives of Priam's sons. Yet not that Priam would have disdained a nymph as a wife to his son, or that Hecuba would have hid her kinship with me. I am worthy of being, and I desire to be, the matron of a lord. My hands are such as the scepter could well beseem. Nor despise me, because once I pressed with you the beechen frond, I am better suited for the purpled marriage bed. Remember, too, my love can bring no harm. It will beget you no wars, nor bring avenging ships across the sea. The Tindarid runaway is now demanded back by an enemy under arms. This is the dowry the dame brings proudly to your marriage chamber. Whether she should be rendered back to the Danae, ask Hector your brother, if you will, or Diphobus or Polydamus. Take counsel with grave Antenor, find out what Priam's self persuades, whose long lives have made them wise. Tis but a base beginning, to prize a stolen mistress more than your native land. Your case is one that calls for shame. Just are the arms her lord takes up. Think not, too, if you are wise, that the Laconian will be faithful, she who so quickly turned to your embrace. Just as the younger Atreides cries out at the violation of his marriage bed and feels his painful wound from the wife who loves another, you too will cry. By no art may purity once wounded be made whole. It's lost, lost once and for all. Is she ardent with love for you? So too she loved Menelaus. He, trusting fool that he was, lies now in a deserted bed. Happy Andromache, well wed to a constant mate. I was a wife to whom you should have clung after your brother's pattern. But you are lighter than leaves what time their juice has failed, and dry they flutter in the shifting breeze. You have less weight than the tip of the spear of grain, burned light and crisp by ever-shining suns. This once upon a time, for I call it back to mind, your sister sang to me with locks let loose, foreseeing what should come. What are you doing, Inoni? Why commit seeds to sand? You are plowing the shore with oxen that will accomplish naught. A Greek heifer is one the way to ruin thee. Your homeland and your house, oh, keep her far. A Greek heifer is coming. While yet you may sink in the deep the unclean ship. Alas, how much of Phrygian blood it has aboard. She ceased to speak. Her slaves seized on her as she madly ran. And I, my golden locks, stood stiffly up. Ah, all too true, a prophetess you were to my poor self. She has then, lo, the heifer has my pastures. Let her seem how fair soever of face. Nonetheless, she surely is a jade, smitten with a stranger. She left behind her marriage gods. Theseus, unless I mistake the name, one Theseus even before had stolen her away from her father's land. Is it to be thought she was rendered back a maid? By a young and eager man? Whence have I learned this so well? You ask, I love. You may call it violence and veiled a fault in the word, yet she who has been so stolen has surely lent herself to theft. Blah. But Enoni remains chaste, false though her husband prove, and after your own example she might have played you false. Me, the swift satyrs, a wanton rout with nimble foot, used to come in quest of, where I would lie hidden in covert of the wood, and faunus with horned head girt round with sharp pine needles, where Ida swells in boundless ridges, me, the builder of Troy, well known for keeping faith, loved, and let my hands into the secret of his gifts. 
Whatever herb potent for aid, whatever root that is used for healing grows in all the world is mine. Alas, wretched me that love may not be healed by herbs. Skilled in an art, I am left hapless by the very art I know. That aid that neither earth, fruitful in the bringing of forth of herbs, nor a god himself can give, you have the power to bestow on me. You can bestow it, and I have merited. Have pity on a deserving maid. I come with no Danae, and bear no bloody armor. But I am yours, and I was your mate in childhood's years, and yours through all time to come, I pray to be. Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. Thank you, as always, for listening. I, um, that uh, Theseus bit at the end caught me off guard. Definitely don't love Inoni's take on uh, how Theseus might have handled Helen, but it's neither here nor there. Whew. All right. I cannot believe how close we are getting to 2023. My brain doesn't quite fully want to handle it, as you might be able to tell in this episode. It's a bit wild, but this one was very fun amidst all of my brain uh, malfunctioning. But well, it's true. Uh, so a reminder, I will be doing that special New Year Q&A episode in the first week of January where I will answer all your pressing questions. Last year, again, we had a great selection that I think people really responded to and they learned a lot. So ask away. Do you have a myth or character specific question? Shout it. Do you want to know more about podcasting or learning the classics or any of my guests topics? shout it. I am open to whatever. Just uh, telling you now, though, that I will only talk minimally, if at all, about my tattoos. I don't know why it always gets asked, so I'm just warning you. I'm still an introvert, after all, so submit your questions through the form at mythsbaby.com slash questions. There's one more week of new episodes before the end of the year, and then some fun re-airs that I know you all are going to love. Plus, they give me that chance to attempt to take some time off, but actually probably spend it all in the Sparta series, because I am a masochist who likes to prepare full series of special episodes at the beginning of the year, i.e. the only time I ever spend at home that I don't necessarily have to prep endless content. I'm chill. I'm reasonable. I'm fine. I've definitely learned my lesson after five years. Can you hear the sarcasm? Anyway, this Sparta series is going to be so great, so interesting, and such a great melding of traditional myth and myth-making and history and more, plus my guests. Oh, you're going to love the guests that I have coming. It's all a thrill. As always, uh, let's leave you with a reading of a five-star review. Consider leaving me one on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else that accepts reviews because it helps and it makes me very happy. This one is from Luca Collins One in Australia. Don't look back! Liv's rendition of Orpheus's descent into the underworld is fabulous, witty, thoroughly researched, and brilliantly told, and at last I get the reference in the title of Bob Dylan's Taco. Great series. Cheers, Luca. Thank you, Luca. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians, and she handles so many podcast-related things. God, it's just everything. I don't know what I would do without her now. She's been here almost a year. Can you believe it? Man, time flies. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. She is also the best. Captions, accessibility, it's all it's so necessary. I'm losing it. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where you will get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. <sighs> you nerds are the best. I am Liv and I... I am losing my mind, but I do still love this shit.